I love watching the Game of Thrones. Whenever a new episode is released, my partner and I make time in the evening to watch it. Seriously, it is a remarkably well-made TV series with a versatile, well-told story about some universal human passions, such as the passion for power. I also love history, especially late medieval history, from which apparently George Martin borrowed some of the plot elements of the Game of Thrones. But I have bad news for you today. Medieval politics was not like the Game of Thrones. First, for all its flavor of family drama, with uh, royalty and nobility playing a huge role, medieval history was much more about institutions than it was about personalities. It was about guilds, city councils, and courts of law, much more than it was about kings and queens like Cersei or Robert Baratheon. It was not about leaders claiming to bring change like Daenerys, but about leaders pretending that nothing has changed. Indeed, to call something a novelty in late medieval politics meant to say it's a totally useless idea. So leaders who wished to bring change had to mask change and innovation as continuity and tradition. Most importantly, unlike in the Game of Thrones, in late medieval Europe, the greatest devastation was brought not by wars for inheritance. The Middle Ages ended with a conflict over ideas, not over some kind of an iron throne. This particular conflict was brought about by the quest for the moral politics. I will explain in a moment what I mean. But first, let me try to answer a very basic question. Why does it matter to me personally that we should understand something about how late medieval society and politics worked? This is a question many people actually asked me when I said I'm giving this talk. I see around us today many things that remind me of the time when the secular states of late medieval West were declining, and when identity politics based on religion was on the rise. So I can think of at least two ways how knowing something about medieval history may help us to understand something about our politics today. Reason one, our society operates on the assumption that countries are stable entities. Their borders and political institutions are more or less fixed, and they have permanent representation in the United Nations. When an international order, which is based on states, is threatened, we're overwhelmed with a sense of crisis. This is because states give us a sense of security. Sometimes true, in other cases false, but they do. So what can be more stable than a country? Obviously, this is a delusion. In each of our countries in Europe today, there are some institutions that are older than the state. Many of these institutions were founded in the Middle Ages. The University of Paris is much older than the Republic of France in its current borders, not to mention its political institutions. The University of Tartu is older than the state of Estonia. The Ospedale Maggiore Hospital in Milan is much, much older than the state of Italy. And organized market exchanges, like the exchange of Bruges, have in total existed much longer than the current kingdoms of Belgium and the Netherlands. At the time when these institutions were created, they lived in a totally different landscape, with different political institutions, different borders, and vastly different laws. So how can this knowledge help us? Well, in the time of new global instability, we can learn what it takes to create robust and resilient institutions that can serve the needs of people, like the universities and hospitals of medieval Europe that were run by public-minded collectivities of individuals and outlived many countries with their borders and laws, serving the needs of society as it changed. For an institution, to set goals that go beyond the current national benchmarks of whatever government is in power is actually a good idea. For a government to be sufficiently humble to recognize that some institutions are too important to be meddled with on a daily basis. 
is an even better idea. Moreover, we should strive to create institutions that serve the needs of people that could possibly outlive our current states. Reason two, in our society and in our politics, like in the politics of late medieval cities and principalities, we are guided by some idea of the good life. Sometimes it's a pretty general idea. For example, politicians think that a country with a rising GDP is much better than a country with a falling GDP. But sometimes it's a much more specific idea. Some leaders think that a country with stringent controls of migration or sexuality or religion is a much better country. So in late medieval Europe, in some countries, some governments also had what I would call a fairly general and even materialist idea of the good life. For instance, peace, trade and prosperity were the idea of the good life in the Netherlands in the 15th century. On the one hand, there were the prosperous cities like Ghent and Bruges with their own self-government, which proclaimed these values. On the other hand, there were the Dukes of Burgundy, who were the lords of those cities, who ruled the territory of today's Belgium and the Netherlands, who also had advisors that proclaimed that protection of peace and trade are very important. So when those two elites were at war with each other, which was often, they still continued to maintain that protection of peace and trade is important. This was a very general, non-specific idea of the good life for the community. Of course, they also assumed that everybody is Christian. That went without saying. Religion was a big business, but it didn't dictate politics on an everyday basis. And in fact, in the 15th century, the Burgundian Netherlands were remarkably prosperous. Now, already the next generation had a much more specific idea of the good life. What happened? The generation of leaders and advisors born at the turn of the 15th to the 16th century championed a new religious culture. They believed that instead of donating to a church occasionally or going on a pilgrimage, you should live your Christian beliefs in your daily life. Now, one of these people was Erasmus, whom many people in Europe know by name because there is a scholarship scheme named after him. Erasmus criticized the ruling elites of his time for being too secular, rather like some populists today criticize the establishment. He believed that rulers should not rely on institutions, on lawyers and other experts, but only on their conscience. Erasmus even thought that among Christians, signing contracts was not a good idea, because you do not cheat your Christian brothers, so signed contracts are not necessary. Now, this kind of naivete was attractive. The whole idea of, good, of what good politics means was rewritten. This was the new sincerity in politics. The next generation went one step further. They basically proclaimed that in order for a country to live well, all its people had to follow the right religious principles. Now, unfortunately for them, that was exactly the time when different parts of society today we call them Protestants and Catholics, started having different religious principles. So the people in power took it upon themselves to decide which set of religious principles was right and to impose their vision of the good life with arms. The effect this very specific idea of the good life had on life as such was devastating. Today, many people who know European history think that the war in the Netherlands in the 16th century was about independence from Spain. Maybe, but for those who started it, and especially for those who tried to defend the status quo, this war was about which religious principles should be followed by the community, about the idea of the good life. And it was a very bloody war. In a single episode in Antwerp, about 7,000 people were killed. Only think of it. The Middle Ages in Europe ended with mass murder, not for the sake of inheritance or some kind of an iron throne. People killed 
for a narrowly understood idea of the good life. In some parts of the world, this is still happening today. And in terms of economic prosperity, the age of religious wars was the steep downturn for most of Europe. So what can we learn from this? No, it's not only about secularism. Though secularism does help when you have groups of people with different, sometimes clashing ideas in your society. But importantly for us today, we can also learn that when politics becomes a quest for a narrowly understood idea of the good life, it ends badly. Trying to implement a very inflexible, stringent idea of the good life with political power can lead to devastating consequences. Making politics more moral may be a slogan that leads to less competence and ultimately to more conflict and less prosperity. Thank you.